Hello and welcome to Linux Lads, episode 117. As usual, I'm Shane and I'm joined by Mike, Connor and Amalith. Say hello, everyone. Hello, hello everyone. everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so today uh, we're going to launch straight into it because we have some fairly big news. So Connor was quoted in the Irish Times. We'll leave a link to the article in the show notes, but the, the gist of it is, is that a journalist from the Irish Times went to the Dublin Linux Install Fest last month and uh, got a few quotes from Connor and published an article in the Irish Times about it. So uh, he's kind of famous now, so... <laughs> I, I wouldn't really say that. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was quite cool. I, I reached out to her on Mastodon and invited her along just to say, like, hey would you like to come along uh, it wasn't her, just her specifically I tagged a few Irish journalists or Irish bloggers and said hey it might be something cool you know help promote it uh, to be perfectly honest I thought that they would just boost the Mastodon uh, post kind of just to spread the word a bit uh, she said, and then she kind of DM'd me or I think just publicly at replied and we had a conversation back and forth and she said, oh yeah, I'll be interested in that. I'll be uh, coming along. Uh, I said, oh yeah, cool. Didn't, 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 didn't think much about it and then uh, turned up on the day and I was like, oh yeah, cool. Uh, and explaining things and we had a couple of demonstration we, demonstration machines. So we had about four or five uh, laptops all lined up with various different Linux distributions, mostly based on Ubuntu. But there was like uh, there was a Debian computer running uh, like the, I think it was like in an Asus EPC with like one gig of RAM. We used to have one of those. It was like it was crazy. Like it's a thirty-two bit hardware run with one gigabyte of RAM, and it was. Uh, so we were like showing that, like yeah, and I actually think that that got mentioned in the article as well. Uh, and I was like, yeah, so here's a, like a Windows XP era computer uh, that's running like fully up to date Windows uh, or not Windows, fully ro- up to date Linux. And I was kind of using that as an example of, you know, we don't you don't have to leave hardware behind just because Windows has stopped supporting this hardware doesn't mean that Linux has stopped supporting this hardware. So I was using that as an example. And of course, Mike was there with his Azahi uh, computer as well. I I think she kind of briefly looked at that, but she seemed to be very interested in the um, uh, some of the computers that I was showing her, and I was also uh, showed her the uh, a computer, my own computer running uh, Zorn OS. So we had Zorn OS, we had Linux Mint, and so she was quite interested in uh, Zorn OS. And I offhanded said that Zorn OS is a registered business in Dublin, like it's our Irish guys who are, who are making it and she, and she, in the article I think she, she says, oh it's it's Irish Linux, so I'm good, obviously I'm going to try running that, so I was like ah, yeah, sure, <laughs> <laughs> whatever motivates you, and I was like, yeah, cool uh, there it is, and like, and so we helped her install that on the day, and she actually came along with her Microsoft Surface, so um Dave, who's a part of the community, uh, gave her, uh, like, took her to one side and freed me up so that I'd be kind of bouncing around other people. Um, and then he took it upon himself to get uh, Zorn OS running on her Surface, Microsoft Surface. So that was very hmm. cool. And it was, and she goes through her experience in, in the article, which <laughs> I kind of figured that because she was kind of wrote, writing her notes in her in her notepad that. I might get some sort of mention at some stage, but didn't have any idea of when or to what extent. So yeah, it's it's kind of nice to see your your name being mentioned in an article. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, like obviously big thanks to Carolyn Lillington. I, I hope I'm saying her name right. Big thanks to her for for shouting us out and and like our, uh, by us I mean our community and very. I would say it's a very well researched article. Like uh, you know, a lot sometimes a lot of the coverage about Linux and open source and mainstream media tends to be a little bit surface level and sort of not really getting the point. But this is a very well researched article. Clearly, she clearly knows her stuff. Um, You know, I'd encourage everyone to read it. There will be a link to the article in the show notes, as I said. So, Mike, you put one in. You've tried NixOS again in parentheses. (laughs) So what's that all about? Yeah, it's basically I was uh, re uh, redoing the install on my uh, on my x86 uh, laptop and was thinking of what to put on it. Uh, I kind of need Blender, which I might get into later because I want to run Coolify. I wanted to run it in Incus containers, and I tried it on Fedora, and that 
didn't work well, well not even fedora on uh, nobara linux which is based on fedora and that didn't work so i decided to new can pay for the whole install and i thought what do i do so i uh, decided to complicate my life further with nix os and it's just uh, confusing i believe if i stick with it uh, i'll get to be quite you know proficient or confident in it but uh, uh, right now everything is uh, extremely foreign i do appreciate the fact that you can uh, write up a basically a description of something and then if you need it to reproduce it somewhere else you can take it you can basically just make the distro recreate itself from the description or descriptions to a certain point what i don't appreciate is the language is written it in the uh, it's a specific language for uh, for the next next best packaging uh, system in which you declare uh, what packages you want to install and what the configuration is of many things configure you, you know you write your you can write your vimrc values into into the configuration file and you can also configure your firewall in it and so on uh it's just the language is probably what's uh, right now killing or not killing uh, killing it but uh definitely dampening my enthusiasm but maybe i will overcome it um, my my any exposure that I've had with NixOS, so, so I've seen a couple of uh, YouTube tutorials on it, and I've kind of went, oh, it's an interesting concept. Um, I've never actually got around to try it out in in a, in a virtual machine or on bare hardware. And uh, what the the one that's supposed to be uh, like an easier version of NixOS is like Snowflake OS. Uh, I've think I've tried that, but I'm like. Oh, it's GNOME. I don't like GNOME. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, so, to, uh, to get the whole concept of it, and it does seem to be intriguing, but there is such a uh, a learning curve to it. It's kind of like a complete mind shift change on how to approach installing packages and maintaining your operating system. And I, as anyone who's, who's kind of interacted with me knows that I, tend to do t- things via the GUI and I try to try to click around things and try to see if I can discover things that way. NixOS is not really friendly to that approach. Um, I'm not saying that I couldn't learn it, but it would definitely be, it would require not not a, a huge amount of effort, I suppose, if I had to. I could probably get it done in a weekend, the basics, and then going forward from there but then it would would just have to be a very conscious effort by me and i'm like why would i when there are other linux distros out there that do the job and do not require that learning curve so that is that is generally my attitude to nix pretty much yeah yeah it's 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 not for me so yeah i i don't i don't really use it it doesn't have any feature that i particularly need so you know, I'm an older gentleman now. I've turned 42 uh, recently, so I need puzzles <laughs> to keep the old cerebrum going, you know? <laughs> yeah, you got to keep the mind, got to keep the, 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 the cogs greased. <laughs> yeah. Some people do Sudoku. Uh, I I just uh, install a weird Linux distro. <laughs> so next up, Amaleth, you've discovered Swatch Internet Time. Tell us what that is. So scheduling things internationally is a pain in the ass in my experience. And part of that is time zones and daylight savings time and 12 hour time versus 24 hour time. And there's, it, just, there's just a ton of local differences that make it difficult. Swatch Internet Time was originally a marketing ploy by the company called Swatch, but I still think the idea is cool. They divided the mean solar day into a thousand parts and they call them a dot beat or just a beat. Each beat is 86.4 seconds or about 1.44 minutes. So the conversion isn't super clean, but with rounding, it's close enough for scheduling stuff. So it eliminates that 12 hour versus 24 hour, the 60 seconds in 60 minutes in an hour, and then a thousand parts in milliseconds. It's just weird. It. I feel like this is a bit of a, a greenfield approach to keeping time. So they fix a lot of issues we've had with other systems. And I've integrated it into a few places around my desktop. And it's been fine so far. May I introduce you to the concept of the French Revolution? It came with two interesting inventions. One of them was uh, the guillotine. And the other one was uh, decimal time. Mm-hmm. 
Unfortunately, I didn't take off, but there is a channel on Mastodon that I that I uh, that I have where uh, all it does, uh, not your channel, sorry, it's a Mastodon bot that all it does, it posts today is something, something in French, you know, like <laughs> one Primidi, where Primidi is the day name, like Monday mm-hmm. or something, I think, of this made up, uh, of this uh, name of a month of the year 270 something, because that's how long it's been since the French Revolution. Uh, I am a brick, I, I would love a decimal time. I would like decimal everything because it's the only way I can count. I only mm-hmm. have 10 fingers, <laughs> not not sometimes 12 and sometimes 21 and sometimes two and a half thousand and, and sometimes 365. But, you know, it doesn't work out. Uh, it's just, uh, I have to watch my blood pressure as well. And you mentioned Swatch and that kind of gives me, gives me you know, my heart rate goes up because I have a lovely Swatch watch. And uh, because they are big on the mic marketing, uh, I gave myself a bit of a vendor lock-in with them. I have a watch for which you can no, no longer get a strap. And it's only like, I only got it, what, three years ago? Well, that sucks. As a present. And uh, their straps have got, uh, they, are, they have cutouts for, mm-hmm. basically, it's a com- not, not complicated, right? It's a proprietary system. And so you need that strap for this watch of particular dimensions, and you can no longer get it. Um, but yeah, back to your, sorry, back to the time. So you're actually using uh, the Swatch internet time in, in some services. Yeah, I've integrated around my desktop. So any anywhere I can see what time it is locally, I see right beside it what it is in Swatch internet time. Yeah. And back with French decimal time that you mentioned, one beat is equal to one decimal minute in French decimal time. So it's pretty much the same unit, I guess. The dream is alive. That seems so like, like it seems so clunky though because a, a decimal minute it says eighty six point four seconds. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. That just strikes me as quite like cumbersome or something. I don't know. Um, well, it's not how, a like nice round number. How often do you think in tenths of a second though? How often do you think in seconds? Usually it's just hours and minutes. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, it's yeah. Time is never going to be. Uh, perfectly allocated unless we all live on a starship where it doesn't really matter and we can just divide everything into star dates and star seconds <laughs> but uh it's uh it would be nice to have just one time for those for the entire planet mm-hmm. and it's five o'clock here and it's five o'clock in sydney and uh, i know this is not what it does I, I, I know it's a lot more than this but talk about star dates anytime that um on Star Trek, when a a captain or a member of the crew is like saying, "Oh yeah, uh, personal log, star date, blah 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 blah," I, to me, I I never actually know enough about it to figure out what they're actually referring to. I to me, it's like this just uh, is a whole string of t- things to make me sound cool. <laughs> it's made up, I believe. I don't think that it, I don't think that uh, Rodenberry or uh, whatever. I don't think that the creators of Star Trek actually ever came up with the definition of a star date i might there might be some fan made but i think it, i i think i read somewhere it was all made up that it's not actually but i could be wrong that's true i actually literally looked this up now so it says that uh it, it makes it makes it impossible to convert all star dates into equivalent calendar dates especially since star dates were originally intended to avoid specifying exactly when star trek takes place <laughs> um the original method was inspired by the modified julian date so, I don't know. Go on Wikipedia and find out what that is, I suppose. <laughs> I never remember. We are in Gregorian, not Julian calendar, right? Julian is the one where you have Christmas. In a... No, I never mind. doesn't matter. Gregorian calendar is what we're using now. Yeah. Oh, there is something else to mention about Swatch Internet Time. So, it does do away with time zones and everything, but it still has to... It counts from zero to a thousand. But where does zero start in relation to the rest of the world? It's based on uh, CET, which is UTC plus one, and they call it Beale Mean Time. And Beale is just where Swatch's headquarters is located. Yeah, CET is Central European Time. Yes. So zero in Swatch Internet Time is midnight in Beale, Switzerland. Cool. Some marketing exec had a, had a, <laughs> had an idea in 19, what, 1995 or something? I think it was 98. 98. Yeah. It was announced and on 23 October 1998. 
and the idea still lives on, but you cannot get a strap for a three-year-old watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they invented a whole new system of time, but you can't get a strap for your watch. Gas. Oh, you can't even <laughs> buy a watch from them that uses Swatch Internet Time anymore. They invented it, and they don't produce hardware that implements it. <laughs> they used to, but they discontinued them in, I think, 2016 or maybe 2006, I don't remember, was the last time they produced a swatch, a, a watch that uses Swatch Internet Time. They do have the coolest designs, at least from where I'm standing. It's a bit of, it's probably, you know, a, a real fine schmaker for a well, real, a real, um, what do you call people who really like something? Ah, uh, come on. Connoisseurs, no, not connoisseur. Connoisseurs, yes. Oh, a real, okay. I don't want to say fetishist, but a real, uh, a real watch connoisseurs probably, you know, with their, uh, omegas or whatever. They, they probably, they, they might be frowning on swatch, but I like the designs and I like the prices because the, 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 they are, they are not too expensive by and large. I, I thought you were, I thought you were going to say hipsters there for a sec. <laughs> <laughs> Having a Swatch watch in the 90s was a real a real cool status symbol, you know? You, you, you get a Swatch watch for your birthday. I don't think I'd ever heard of Swatch until discovering their their time thing. Uh, it's a European thing. You wouldn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, do, I do remember like, like really inexpensive Swatch watches and they were all brightly coloured plastic pieces of shit. <laughs> that was my my, uh, my impression of them. Yeah, pretty much because they were loud and colourful, yeah. But but actually well made. Uh, you know, you can have... But uh, mine is just uh, pretty conservative blue and silver. And it's the last watch. They have got the whole gamut, you know. You cannot get a poison, poison green. Uh, you cannot get a neon green and purple uh, hue blow. But you can definitely get... A gum, a, a, the whole design palette of Swatch from your uh, really, really nice colors, uh, you know, really striking colors to puke green conservative timepieces. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, when, you, when you're saying, oh, yeah, they, like you, you can get a, a, a watch that's like purple and green, and I'm like, yeah, that's the reason not to buy it. <laughs> that is a reason to buy something. Purple and green go well together. They do. I think so. For well, uh, for me, I was like, "There's a solid, dependable um, uh, watch brand that you can buy anything from a ten euro watch, everything up to a thousand euro for a watch, all from the same brand. It's called Casio." <laughs> yeah. Yes, because you've ca- never the left calculator the 80s. watches you'd use to cheat in maths. <laughs> I also have a Casio Connor. I also have a Casio watch. Is orange. Uh, yeah, so see, see, they do they um, make watches for people without taste as well. So get a Casio. <laughs> <laughs> so what about you, Shane? You've been messing with i three, I hear. Yeah, I yeah, I wasn't even going to bring this up because like I ba- <laughs> so this is the story. I I was like, I have this old laptop. Um, it's an old Lenovo ThinkPad, and it, it's it's fairly old and janky like I I didn't it didn't cost me that much and I don't really use it that often um but I I was kind of and it has a really like awful screen resolution that isn't like I've mentioned this before I think but it's it's not 720 and it's not 1080 it's something in between uh it's awful like I hate the screen on it it's it just looks really pixely and, and just offensive to the eyes um, and it's got a really thick bezel around the screen and everything. So I just don't like the laptop. And it's got one of those really thick batteries that, you know, so it kind of, because the, the laptop itself is thin enough, but then it's uh, it's actually right here. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, but then you've got this like big chunky battery mm-hmm. that just sticks out the bottom. Um, but I was going to put up with using it because I don't always like to sit at the desk. I, I want, wanted to practice some coding, so I wanted to be able to just sit at the, the dining table and do it or sit on the couch um, uh, and do it, you know, just or go to the library or something if I want some peace and quiet. Uh, so I was like, I want to, and I don't like the trackpad on it is my point. The trackpad is really awful. I just, just don't enjoy using it. So I was like, okay, well, I'll just get a distro where I can do basically everything with the keyboard. So I thought I'll install i3 on it. Um, I did, and <laughs> it did not go well. <laughs> uh, I, I basically, I looked up a bunch of tutorial videos. I looked up all the cheat sheets of all the keyboard shortcuts. Um, I forget the version. I, I installed, I think it was Endeavor OS with i3. Um, I'm, I, I might be getting that wrong. 
Uh, it's been a few weeks now, so I'm not entirely sure. I, I, I think when you mentioned it in the in our chat amongst ourselves, I think you did say it was Endeavour. So yeah, that's my recall of what you said. One of the ones that have a version of it, yeah. That's it, yeah. So because I, I didn't want to like go down the pure arch, vanilla arch route because I, I just couldn't be arsed, to be honest with you. You and, couldn't be uh, arched. <laughs> I could, <laughs> but uh, there, there, there's also isn't there regolith, which is like i three that's based off Ubuntu as well. So I think so. Yeah, I I wanted something where it just served up i three ready to go. I didn't want to faff about with anything. Yeah, I installed Endeavor OS. I chose i three as my default, uh, my default desktop, and then opened it up. Half the commands didn't even work properly, so I was just hitting the command and nothing was happening. So I think there's different implementations of it depending on the distro. That And I was like scrolling through subreddits and everything, trying to figure this out, pulling my hair out. And then there'd be this stupid lock screen that came up all the time for no reason. And it was like a green circle thing. And I found out that's the lock screen. I3 lock. It responds to your uh, key presses and shows like the direction <laughs> on the circle. Why? I don't understand it. I just I just did not get it. I was like, what is the point of this circle? Like, why do, <laughs> is it here? It's just something to look at that reacts <laughs> when you press a key. It, and I couldn't unlock the laptop. I literally, like, I was typing my password in and it just wouldn't unlock. And I was actually losing my my mind. Like I was on the like I was genuinely getting really annoyed with the, with this. And you know when you get to a stage where you're like, I need to just close this laptop and step away, or else I'm going to break this thing. Like literally. Um. So yeah, close the laptop after about an hour in in an absolute rage and never opened it again. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was my experience with i three. <laughs> Part of that experience might have been due to configuration. I don't know whether Endeavor configures i3 out of the box, so you might have been stuck with the default key bindings, but I assume other distros like Regolith, um, I know Manjaro's i3 edition puts the key bindings on the wallpaper, so they're, everything you need to use it is right there in front of you and you can just look at it. But yeah, there's a huge learning curve and it's extremely DIY and you have to get into the weeds and config files and figure out all the bindings and stuff and memorize them. I'm totally happy to do that as well. I don't mind getting my hands dirty with stuff like that and digging into config files. In fact, I find it fairly interesting sometimes, but only if it's kind of behaves in the way that I expect it to. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't. It was like I was looking up the keyboard shortcuts and pressing them and nothing was happening. So I was like, interesting. okay, where do I even go from here? Like, um, so I, I don't know, I, there could have been, I'm not sure what the reason for that was, but um, I did a lot of research and I tried to find the answer. I tried to get past the problem, but uh, I didn't just like blame it immediately. But <laughs> I have heard that Awesome is another tiling window manager that I hear is a little bit, uh, just a tad more accessible. Yeah. Um, there's there's differences between i3 and Awesome, but, but uh, a, lo a lot of people uh, do prefer Awesome. They say it is a little bit easier to get to grips with. Do you do have to so the advantage of getting it from Endeavor OS is that they put the that they put the D menu in there or whatever they put the lock screen they put everything together. Uh, the disadvantage obviously is that they might have configured it in a certain way that you wouldn't be expecting. But I've tried a few times doing this kind of thing myself. Like you install a distro pretty much just just the black screen, you know, and then you then you add these things on top, and it, it can take maybe a day of work if you don't know what 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 you to expect to figure out that you need this thing for the menu up, up front and then you are choosing from menus you need this thing for locking the screen this you need this another thing for uh, changing backgrounds uh, and and so on and so on it can be quite uh, entertainment for a while <laughs> And uh, what is what is Suede? Suede is like i3 for Wade, is it? Or yes, yep. yeah. that's exactly it. Yeah, I think Suede that's uh, Drew Devolt's uh, yes. project. And oh, he started uh, it originally. I don't think he has really anything to do with it anymore, except as a user. Yeah, it's. I I don't know. I think I understand the appeal, but I'm never organized enough myself to. Uh, to basically be f able to figure out a layout that I would stick to. Having said that, I'm using the KD tiling, uh, you know, uh, meta T. Uh, you create a layout, and now I have this screen uh, split into 
three parts just by that and it's super easy but for that you need to use the mouse as far as i know there might be keyboard shortcuts but anyway so that about wraps it up for this week you can discuss this episode on our forum forum.linuxlads.com uh, we always post a, a thread for every single episode for more long-form conversation that you know would probably get lost in the telegram chat i want to shout it out we never really do but we have a steam community um for the few times we game if, if you're fancy we are mostly active on Telegram uh, and Mastodon. Uh, you can find all the links on, sh- on uh, linuxlads.com forward slash contact. Uh, the best way to get in direct touch with us, though, uh, with any feedback or suggestions is show at linuxlads.com. Um, we read all emails we receive, so give us a shout there. And uh, we will see you again in approximately two weeks. Bye. Adios. Goodbye. Bye. And 10 seconds of silence. That was a long 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah. was somebody else going to mention it or is Shane going to mention it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like, it just seemed to go by so slowly. Like, um, anyway. <laughs>